Hello, my name is uh, Thorsten Höffler. I'm a professor at ETH Zurich, and I want to briefly present to you my lab, the Scalable Parallel Computing Lab at uh, ETH Zurich. So first, let me start with the university itself. So the university is a well-known university in continental Europe. It's often uh, praised as, as one of the best, or if not uh, the best, uh, that is, of course, up to interpretation. Um, in, in many of the rankings, ETH Zurich usually uh, fares very high, especially in the computer science ranking, which is uh, what um, very, which is my area in, in, this, in this field. So we have about 22,000 students, of which 4,000 are actually doctoral students. So it is a research-centered university. So our focus is on the education um, at, um, at the bachelor's and master's level, but also at the education at the PhD level to, uh, to produce uh, top-class scientists, as well as, of course, uh, top-class bachelors and masters um, in, in Switzerland. So what is my lab now about? So my lab really looks at performance of parallel computing systems. So any computing system today essentially is a parallel computing system. So you could really argue it looks at, at performance, all aspects of performance. And where we have a holistic full stack view ranging from algorithms to applications to hardware to software. I'm working with students who work on very theoretical aspects, proving theorem, theorems. I'm working with students who work on applications like weather and climate applications, as I will talk about in a, in a minute. We design hardware and we also design software systems or, or middleware systems. So we really work across the stack. The focus is always on performance, of course. So we are integrated in the uh, computer science department at ETH Zurich, but we have extremely strong ties to the Swiss National Supercomputing Center. So we could, uh, I could argue that, <laughs> that the integration is, is there about as much as in computer science. So we focus on high performance uh, systems and, and all aspects of high performance in all kinds of different contexts, mainly in the context of data center networking that I want to talk about specifically, where we look at the topologies and routing and in-network processing, in the context of performance programming, where we are looking at the data-centric uh, Python or the message passing interface, and in the context of large-scale applications, which uh, today the, the, the focus applications are deep learning, various aspects, uh, mostly uh, transformer-based systems or transformer-based networks, as well as weather and climate uh, codes in, in order to predict the climate or the weather of the next days. So let me first talk a little bit about data center networking. What, what do we do there? What, what, what does it mean uh, to look at data center networking in the context of SPCL? at a high, um, in, in the context of high performance computing. So a data center network is really a rather complex system because you have a node, which is your computer, uh, your endpoint, connected to other nodes through um, a network interface card, as you can see here. But the network interface card is typically in high performance computing systems, a remote direct memory access uh, card that deposits data right into the memory. So this really the CPU is really connected through the memory to the network card to remote nodes. And now, if packets are coming from remote nodes, incoming into the, the, uh, the, the target node, they're usually processed in RDMA um, and an RDMA processing engine with the DMA unit on the NIC, are then moved into the input buffer in memory, and are then read through various buses, through various levels of cache, into the registers of the CPU where they're finally processed. Um, now, if you look at the rates of those um, on, on modern networks, we can actually see one packet every 1.2 nanoseconds. And now go back to all these latencies that we see here. So bandwidth-wise, we can, we can digest all these packets, but latency-wise, it, uh, it is quite interesting. So even the PCI Express bus itself has 250 nanoseconds latency. So we need a way to process these packets extremely fast and efficient. And what is predestined to do this? Well, it is the NIC, because the NIC has direct access to these packets. It's the first incoming port for these packets, and it just performs RDMA processing to deposit the packet into main memory. Question is, what else could the NIC do with these packets? Could it do part of the processing that the CPU would do? And the answer is yes. And this is exactly what we, what we developed. So we developed an abstract machine model, or actually also a practical implementation of it, for packet processing. But let me talk a little bit about the machine model. You all know how to program CPUs through an instruction set architecture with a sequential or parallel program. Packet processing is quite different because there you don't have input arrays or input files, but you really have input packets. It really has to fit into the architecture of the network card itself. So you have an in, uh, input port which is arriving packets, where there's a, typically a packet scheduler in a network card that schedules the packets into free locations in an in input buffer, which is a fast shared memory. What we add then is we add so-called um, handler processing units, which is a parallel processing system that reads packets from this shared memory 
processes them in a programmable way and then outputs these packets to the main CPU, to the main memory, through a DMA unit, through a read-write access into the, the main memory. So we kind of process the packets with a parallel programming system, a specialized parallel programming system, as they fly by through the network card. So the CPU itself is, is only tangentially involved in that processing because what it does, it uploads the right code, the right programs to execute on the NIC, and it manages the memory where to deposit things on the NIC. So it's kind of a management role. You can think about this if you're a fan of CUDA or acceleration. This is the CUDA for the NIC. So we accelerate programs running on the NIC in a very speci specific framework, really like CUDA does. But it's, of course, a packet processing language, so it's slightly different from CUDA. So just to illustrate this again, we have these packets that are coming in. They're deposited into this fast shared memory. Um, then from this fast shared memory, they move in these handler processing units. They're processed in, uh, by these processing units, and then they're simply forwarded into the main memory of the CPU, and then the CPU proceeds with whatever the CPU would be doing with the packets anyway. That was the first part of, of what we do in, in the Scalable Parallel Computing Lab. Let me move on to the second part, programming for high performance. I mentioned DACE, uh, data-centric Python, as well as uh, MPI. So let me go a little bit more uh, broader. Computer systems are extremely complex to program and ex even more complex to program efficiently. Like programming is relatively simple, actually. You just have to make sure that the code does what you want. But now making it do it fast or energy efficient is a completely different beast, mainly because the systems are extremely complex. We have one supercomputer, which is or one data center, which is, has a lot of cabinets, but each of those cabinets now has hundreds, if not thousands of nodes, or each of these clusters. And each of these nodes has hundreds, if not uh, thousands um, of, um, of, of cores. And each of these, I mean, uh, sorry, each of these nodes has about hundreds, of course, um, of chips, uh, uh, tens of two hundreds of chips. Each of those has uh, tens of uh, two hundreds of cores. Each of those cores has lots of, um, of um, of, uh, well, uh, finer elements <laughs> and, and transistors and, and logic gates. And at the end, uh, we have tons of devices that we have to um, orchestrate in this way. So at the end, performance of systems, of today's systems, is extremely complex and extremely tricky because we have all these devices to coordinate. And then what we see in practice is really these different chips, like a GPU here, a different GPU, um, an AMD GPU, FPGAs uh, from Intel and from uh, Xilinx, and of course also Fujitsu vectorized CPUs and, and Intel CPUs. So there's a large variety, and this is why we must make sure that the performance is actually portable across different devices. So each of these devices is complex, but then we have a lot of different devices. So how do we deal with this? Well, we deal with this like in many, many um, aspects of computer science, we introduce levels of abstraction. So one level of abstraction is that we take the domain scientist or so the programmer and try to isolate the programmer from the particular aspects of that system by having giving the programmer a very productive high-level language, in our case in Python, um, to express whatever the program shall do. Then there's an applied scientist who translates that into a, into a completely different um, representation from the imperative specification of the domain scientist into a data-centric data flow specification of the, um, of the performance engineer. And then the performance engineer, after that translation, optimizes this data-centric view. So it works with these graphs where you can look at data flow, how does data flow from A to B between the processing elements, and then map them, map the data flow efficiently to processing elements. And at the end, we generate code for uh, CPU, GPU, and, and FPGAs. Um, so that is how it works in practice. At the end, the domain scientist writes a very small amount of code if you've used uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch, you can attest to this because it's usually tens of lines of code to express pretty complex deep neural networks. The performance engineers then, they write so-called transformations that apply to shapes in the graph and that are reusable across different graphs. So we have a library of these transformations that you can apply. And then at the end, the, the code generated is thousands if not tens of thousands of lines of, uh, of code. So now the last part of what we do in the Scalable Parallel Computing Lab is looking at large-scale application. Actually, we try to apply the networking and the data-centric uh, principles to real-world examples, like deep learning or uh, weather and climate simulations. So as you know, weather and climate simulations are incredibly complex and incredibly important today to understand near-term decisions, whether I want to go hiking tomorrow, or far or, or medium-term decisions, whether I want to buy a car that has less, less of a CO2 emission. 
to understand what uh, the impact of, uh, of humanity is on, on the long-term sustainability of the planet. So really, um, there are all kinds of interesting uses for these simulations. And we have uh, participated in, in a Nature article outlining a way to do the medium to long-term predictions and trying to build, or, or even, even short-term, so across all ranges, in fact, try to build a so-called digital twin of the whole Earth, where we have a simulation environment where we can simulate various time scales of how the Earth is behaving in real time. And the question is, of course, well, this is extremely computationally complex, do we do this on a GPU supercomputer, like we would do today, or can we amend this with a deep learning accelerator? Can we actually make this faster? And my, uh, my own view is that in the future, all supercomputers will be AI machines. They will be optimized for deep learning because it's a big market. Um, the CSCS machine, the next one, the Alps machine, is already praised as the world's fastest supercomputer for AI by Jensen Wang at the um, GTC keynote uh, a couple of months ago. So at the end, what's going to happen is that we will combine scientific simulation with deep learning and um, achieve better uh, throughput because we somewhat understand how to do scientific simulations. And as a research group, and we have uh, gotten a Gordon Bell Prize for this in 2019 for running the largest uh, simulation of, of that year with the most efficiency, um, we know how to do this. But now the question is, how do we def combine scientific simulations with deep learning in order to make it even more efficient? And that is a new, interesting, exciting research topic. And let me now elaborate a little bit more on what we do in scalable deep learning. So in scalable deep learning, you really take a deep neural network like this transformer network here, and in fact, it's a bird network, um, and map it to a large-scale supercomputer for training. So we have to deal with three different aspects of the training workload. So one is we have to deal with very high input-output volume. So we have to read data extremely quickly. It's, it's actually, in training, it's more about the input than the output. And this is uh, quite, uh, quite challenging on, on, many, uh, on many file systems, but what we found is that you can actually use features of the randomness in, uh, in, in deep learning, which is not really random because it's pre-computable to implement intelligent prefetching. And, and you can see the clairvoyant prefetching uh, paper down there if you're interested about this. So you can basically predict everything that's happening when you load, when you, what you will load the data with, and then you can uh, apply, um, apply a planning algorithm to this to prefetch this intelligently. The second aspect is high performance computing, we now need to make sure that these deep neural networks are actually computed as efficiently as possible because deep learning is high performance computing. We have the same problems. It's all about data movement. And here, the key result that we have uh, so far looked at is really showing that data movement is all you need because we achieve the highest performance for uh, transformer networks that, that I show up here. So specifically the BERT network um, uh, ever reported on, on a specific V100 GPU or type of GPU and that uh, just showed that uh, about one third of the, uh, the, the computation is spent moving data. So, so that is scary and it's growing. And then the last piece is really about high performance communication. And because now we have to use large clusters with tens of thousands of GPUs in order to, to run with various forms of parallelism, like model parallelism, complex pipeline schemes, sparsification, and various aspects to make this faster. So we have also several works in this area. For example, here, uh, sparse ML or actually an, an overview paper of how to run large scale models and parallelize them in practice. So with that, uh, I'm done. And uh, yeah, thanks for learning about SPCL.